This morning, I want you to turn once again to Psalm 51. We're going to uh, stand together, read this psalm again. I know I taught it last week, but there, it just felt incomplete, and I kind of beat you up about sin, so we want to kind of look at it a bit more. I, I, I want to see if I can get a second punch in. <laughs> All right, Psalm 51. We'll begin with the title, To the Chief Musician, A Psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, and you only, have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. Do good in your good pleasure to Zion, Build the walls of Jerusalem, then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering, then they shall offer bulls on your altar. Oh Lord, what a beautiful psalm before us, a psalm that many of us sinners have turned to in the past. Many of us can relate, in fact most of us should relate, as we realize how gracious and kind you are that we might come to this place of repentance in our hearts and find that joy of restoration. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. You may be seated. Well, like I said, after that study last week, I think it may have left some of you with a bit of a pit in your stomach uh, and that, all that painful discussion surrounding sin and the theology of sin. And uh, that's what we talked about, harmatology, the study of sin. Of course, sin is the dominant theme of this psalm, but certainly it's not the only theme. In fact, we'd be better off looking at Psalm 51 as a song, which, of course, is exactly how it was written. Uh, There are certain definite notes that sort of dictate the music to us from this psalm. And sin is definitely one of those notes, and as I said, a prominent note. Sin is, however, it, though it is the dominant note, dominant note, we know that it is because of what David said in his opening title, a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet went into him after he had gone into Bathsheba. So we can't ignore that. That's the theme, that's the primary purpose, occasion of David's writing of this psalm, the the prominent note, if you will. But another note is that of repentance. Uh, Sin is the root of our problem, uh, which holds every one of us hostage and every human being in chains. Repentance is how we are set free. Repentance is how we come to know the freedom from this problem of sin. It is therefore, repentance is therefore the solution to sin as we come to Christ confessing our sins. Another note, of course, is called responsibility, as in my personal responsibility. 
instead of living in denial, instead of spending my time and my energy trying very hard to, to hide from the truth of myself, to hide in, uh, from the truth of my sinfulness, uh, then I should come and instead confess it, to own up to it as it were. And another note, of course, in this psalm is forgiveness. As we studied in our previous study, we stated that despite our sins, God has already prepared and provided the means of forgiveness, despite the wretchedness. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, and I thank God for that. His mercies are new every morning to us, and we can come boldly into his throne room of grace to find the help, the assistance that we need, and to find forgiveness, no matter how sinful we are. And if you take nothing else from this study this morning, I want you to take that. God's grace is sufficient to forgive you of anything you have done or thought. Another note, and what we'll be focusing most of our attention upon today, is restoration. David said in verse 12, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Restoration. Restore me, David prayed. Restore me to what I already had, what I, al I have already known. But sadly, I've lost. I've lost it. That word restore is a beautiful word. It means to bring back, to put back, or to turn back. Here David is writing about repentance. And so in his, his desire to return to the Lord, to return to a right relationship, he simply asks God to put back that joy that I once knew when I was walking with you. Put it back. It's gone. David, of course, being a committed believer, finds himself at this time backslidden. In fact, backsliding could be another note in this psalm. Backsliding is definitely a, a theme of this whole uh, beautiful song. David, of course, becoming that perfect uh, example of a backslidden believer, a believer who has committed transgressions, iniquities, and sins, all of them in combination, and finds himself far from God. That's the backslider. Backsliding means that we've relapsed or that we have returned to some form of the old life. Oh, not completely, but it could be completely. It could even be worse than the old life. Backsliding affects every area of your life and leads you into misery and into ruin. And many of us know this because we've been down this path. We've been there. We've, we've lived that experience and had the sad condition known as backsliding. David, of course, this sincere, this spiritual man who had sinned so badly, his sin caused him to backslide from his devout life. And now he wants to come home. He wants to come home. David identified the heart of his problem because the heart of his problem was his heart. Created me a clean heart, he prayed. His heart was dirty. His heart was wicked. This shameful sin which David committed originated in his own imagination, the imagination of his own wicked heart, and it no doubt surprised him. But Jeremiah said the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? Jeremiah 17 and verse 9. Jesus tells us something similar. In Matthew chapter 15, he said, For from the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, and sexual immorality, theft, lying, and slander. These are what make a man unclean. David says, created me a clean heart. I'm so dirty. David committed three of those sins, murder, adultery, sexual immorality. That was his sin, and that is what made him feel so unclean. David knew this feeling all too well, and so he asked God, give me a new heart, Lord. He didn't ask God to repair his old heart. 
He didn't ask God to renovate his old heart like we're renovating this building. He asked for something more miraculous than that. He asked for an entirely new heart. For this word create in the Hebrew word is the same one that we find in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God bara, Hebrew. In both cases, the Hebrew word bara is used, which means to create or to bring forth out of nothing. He brought it forth out of nothing. Ezekiel prophesied, I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart in its place. God, it, this is what God wants to do. God wants to answer this kind of prayer. Have you prayed that kind of prayer? You should. You should pray, God, create in me a new heart. Give me a new heart. I'm not satisfied with the one I have. I'm not satisfied with this old one. Give me a new heart. You see, sin had done such a number on David that there was nothing good left in him to bring to God even in worship. There was nothing left. I have nothing to give you. It's all been damaged. His, his heart was so heinous, so, so treacherous and twisted that if it were not for God's mercy, he would have not been spared at all. And so this sincere prayer of his was, create in me, O God, a clean heart. Create in me and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Or, God, please put within me what's no longer there. I know I had it, but now I have nothing left to offer you. I'm empty. David knew that he had nothing to bring to this table with God. And so he said in verse 16 of, of Psalm 51, you do not desire sacrifice or else I would give it. If that was enough, I'd bring it to you, but I know that's not what you desire. You do not delight in burnt offerings, another form of sacrifice, but the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a repentant. The word contrite means repentant. A broken and repentant heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. It's the heart. It's the heart. It's the heart. It's my heart. It's your heart. It's our heart. The deepest part of us. It's where everything stems from. Everything flows from there. And God wants a broken heart, a humble heart, a right heart. And there isn't a ritual for that. There is no religious practice that could satisfy what God is looking for in our lives. He simply requires a right heart. And David's heart was not right, and he knew it. David knew it. And so he asked God, oh, make me right, Lord. Make my heart right. Since we can't fix our own wicked and dead hearts, he's asking for a miracle. And it requires a miracle for your heart to be made right. It requires a supernatural act, and that is something that God must do. God must fix your heart. You can't fix your heart. God has to do it. When we're not right with God, we know it. And like David, we can go through all of the motions as if everything is good, as if everything is right and correct, but we know it's not. We know something is wrong. We'll continue to attend church. We'll even perform Christian duty, Christian service, all the while being spiritually dead inside, spiritually distant, aloof from God. It's only motion with no emotion. It's all done without a sense of love, without the passion for God. Though we once did it with love, we once sensed that love, it's like the prophets of the 60s, the righteous, righteous brothers. Righteous brothers, get it? You've lost that loving feeling, and it's gone, gone, gone. Whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa. What happened? Well, sin happened. That's what happened. And you backslid. Jesus said it this way, you've abandoned, you've left your first love. That's backslidden. That's what happens when we backslide. And we go through weird things when we backslide. 
We don't feel that love anymore. It's, it's just not there. We don't, we don't sense God. He, where is God? Where is his presence? We feel as if we've been, ab- in, we've been abandoned when in truth we're the ones who did the abandoning. It's, it's like the old saying, if you no longer feel close to God, guess who moved? The backslidden Christian is a sad and unhappy Christian. To be a Christian in the first place, it means that you have come to a place in your life where you've confessed your sinfulness, and then you have professed your faith in Jesus Christ. I, would, I will go as far as to say, if those two things haven't happened, you're not a Christian today. You can call yourself a Christian. You can attend church. But if you have not confessed your sinfulness and professed your faith in Jesus Christ, you're not a Christian. Pretend if you wish, but it won't do you any good. You must come to that place in your life where you will confess your sinfulness and profess your faith in Jesus Christ. Now, once you've come to this this place, this divine revelation for yourself, you are born again. And in that place, you've received the miracle of the new birth in Christ and God's holy and divine nature, his Holy Spirit, has been placed within you, that is the new heart, the new heart, the new, the new capacity for spiritual things. And at that moment, when you've come to this realization that you confess you're a sinner and profess your faith in Jesus Christ, you are now made alive by the Spirit of God. And in that moment, you begin to realize everything is brand new, a clean slate, everything starts over. And If you've never felt this, then it's perhaps because you've never been born again. Because when the Holy Spirit comes into your life, you really can't miss it. It's an event. It's something you can't avoid. You can't miss it. You know, you ask yourself, am I a Christian? Well, you know, I think I am. Oh, you've missed something. You've missed it. Something radical has to happen first inside of you first inside of you see religion starts the other way around religion says let's change the outside of you maybe you'll get it over time with enough motion perhaps you'll gain the emotion but it's not done out of love it's done out of submission to religious rule or tradition when in reality the holy spirit wants to work from the inside out so he has to change the root of the problem the heart of the problem which is the heart and he gives you the brand new heart and poof you're you you're suddenly a new person you're born again and now that you are born again everything begins to change from the inside out the heart is new Paul said anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. And one of the immediate sensations that you're going to feel once you've been born again is joy. Joy. Joy because you've realized now my sins are forgiven. Joy because Jesus is alive in you. His Spirit dwells in you. Joy because of that unexpected burst burst of uh, and spiritual spark which has regenerated you, has regenerated your spirit. You're alive. Joy because you belong to God now. You are now his child, no longer a child of darkness, but you belong to the light. You belong to him in the light. Joy because your destiny has changed from damnation to salvation, eternal life in heaven. Joy. You better believe there's joy. Joy because your sins will never, ever, ever be remembered ever in eternity, never to be charged to you again. It's all washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. You better believe there's joy. Joy because we're saved. Joy, joy, joy. Now maybe you don't have this joy and you figure that you don't have it because, well, it's not in your temperament. It's not in your personality to feel joy. Hogwash. Hogwash. Spiritual joy always comes as a result of the new nature, and your temperament and personality have nothing at all to do with it. 
There is this experience of spiritual joy, this inner joy that is associated with God's salvation. And if you don't have it, then something is terribly wrong. A couple of suggestions. Either you're not born again, as I've suggested, or you're not thinking correctly, doctrinally. You're not thinking correctly. You, you're not putting the important things in the right place. There's, there's a disconnect in what you're actually focusing on and thinking on. Or thirdly, you're, you're in sin and you need to repent because sin can surely rob you of that joy. Sin will take away that joy as David found out. David even had to pray, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Put it back. He knew he had it once. He, he knew this joy of God's salvation. Any saved person knows this joy if you were truly saved. You would know it. One of the fruits of the Spirit of God. But sin can spoil that fruit. Sin can spoil it. In David's case, it was this unconfessed sin of adultery. And subsequently, of course, led to murder. That spoiled his joy. That would ruin my day too. This had the potential of ruining his life. Certainly changed it to some degree but he continued to run from it, run from the truth of it, to cover it up, to, to hide it. He pretended it wasn't there, but he couldn't pretend. God exposed it. See, when God's children do the same thing, when, when we run from the truth, when we fail to repent of sin, well, then God must act against us. He acts against us as any loving father would act when his children misbehave, and he does so with discipline. <clears throat> he spanks his children. God spanks his children when they sin. Now you may say, well, I don't, I don't, spank, I don't spank my children. Well, God spanks his. And there's real good results when he does. The 12th chapter of Hebrews says, have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons, as children? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him, when spanked by him. David knew that this, this punishment that he'd received was just. David knew he deserved this for his sin. And he also knew who it was that was holding the other end of the wooden spoon. He knew it. Notice it says in verse 8, Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Oh, he knew. He knew who did it. Sometimes God's chastisements are painful and severe. At least that was the case with David. And we find out going back to the story in 2 Samuel 12, if you'll remember, from this time on, Nathan said to David, <coughs> Excuse me. From this time on, your family will live by the sword. That's a consequence. Because, he said, you have despised me by taking Uriah's wife to be your own. Because of this adultery, your family is going to know strife and the sword. In verse 11 of 2 Samuel 12, thus says the Lord, because of what you have done, I will cause your own household to rebel against you. I will give your wives to another man before your very eyes, and he will go to bed with them in public view. Adultery begets adultery. Adultery begets sin, more sin. In verse 14 of 2 Samuel 12, because by doing this you have made the enemies of the Lord show utter contempt. Therefore, the son born to you will die. Wow. God's discipline may have seemed harsh, even cruel, but it was so needed in the life of David. Later, King David, the same one who wrote Psalm 51, also wrote Psalm 119. In verse 67 and 119, David wrote, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. You are good, and do good. Teach me your statutes. The insolent swear 
I'm sorry, the insolent smear me with lies, but with my whole heart I keep your precepts now. Their heart is unfeeling like fat, but I delight, I love your law. It is good for me that I was afflicted so that I might learn your ways. You see, now we get a better understanding of where David's prayer was coming from when he said, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. His prayer was, Lord, please do whatever you must do to make me right with you. Can you say that prayer? Are you willing to make such a prayer? To offer it to God and whatever it takes, Lord, I want to be right with you. Now, the author of Hebrews ended his teaching on God's discipline with a very similar conclusion. Hebrews 12, 11, he said, For the moment all discipline seems painful, but rather than, painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who learn from it. Righteousness. Right living. Right with God. Through God's discipline. David backslidden. He was backslidden and and yet God's loving kindness, God's discipline brought him home, brought him back. Paul said, don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Can't you see that this kindness is intended to turn you from your sin and lead you to repentance? You may say to yourself, well, gosh, I've been living my life as I wish. I'm not living this holy spiritual life, and yet nothing bad is happening to me. That's just God's kindness. He's giving you patience. He's being patient with you and giving you time to make up your own mind before he says, where did I put that wooden spoon? Have you ever done that with your kids? Have you ever had to threaten them? I'm going to get the spoon. And you know, that, that sort of gets them at least thinking. It's, it's all of the signs on the roadway. You know the signs on the roadway that are all there for our benefit. Curve ahead. Dangerous road. Detour. 55. They're all there for our benefit. The signs that say exit 27 takes you off into the mall area. It tells you directions how to get there. Where to go, where not to go. Wouldn't you be crazy to ignore the signs? We often do. And what happens? Accidents, trouble, problems. And so we pay attention to the signs. Well, God is the same way. He puts up road signs for us. The Word of God. Other brothers and sisters who've been through it that says, don't do this. Let me tell you what happened when I did it. Oh, that's not going to happen to me. <laughs> of course it's going to happen to you. Who do you think you are? Superman or stupid man? Who are you? <laughs> it happens the same to everybody. There's nothing new. Nothing. You're not above it. None of us are above it. It may have been a painful trip for David, but it was a much-needed trip. And through it all, he found mercy, forgiveness, repentance, and he remained faithful from that day forward till he died. He learned. You see, discipline is not only a painful thing, but it's also a frightful thing. Notice what David said in verse 11. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. God, that's, that's a punishment more than what I can bear. That's what he's saying. David is concerned for this. He's afraid of this. Don't throw me away as a useless thing. Don't, don't take your spirit. As so long as your spirit is with me and in me, I feel, I feel like I have a place with you. You take that away, I'm done. Don't, don't cast me out as you did to Cain when he slew his brother Abel. Now, I'm happy to say that in the New Testament relationship, in Christ, this sort of thing doesn't happen. He doesn't take his Holy Spirit away from you, but you'll feel as if he has. 
Because sin hinders the Spirit and the work of the Spirit in your life. Sin will do that. It will quench the Spirit of God. David enjoyed this very special fellowship with God, a relationship like no one else in the Old Testament days. He knew this, this presence of God's Spirit. The Lord's Spirit was upon him very, very mightily in many ways. And David didn't want to lose that privilege at all. Perhaps King David was thinking about King Saul. King Saul was, of course, the first king, as you know. And in 1 Samuel, we read, Now the Spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented Saul. Ooh, that's a frightful thought. Or perhaps he had Samson on his mind, who being proud and, and full of himself and very backslidden, had to learn this lesson the hard way tells us in Judges chapter 16 and verse 20, when Samson awoke from his sleep, he said, I will go out as at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. <laughs> That's a perfect definition of hell. Hell. Do you know what hell is? The absence of God. Hell is the absence of God. Later, Samson would repent, of course, but it would cost him his life, wouldn't it? What is it going to take for the backslider to repent? Because I can assure you this, God will use every means possible because his concern for you is not your happy life on this earth. Your eternal life in heaven is his concern. Come home, Christian. Come home before it's too late. And repent of your sins. Repent to God with a sincere heart. Be renewed. Be restored. That's what this psalm is about. The joy of restoration. The joy of the backslid backslider coming home. Listen. Heed the warnings of Scripture. Heed the, the examples of those of us that have been down that path. Yes, we realize how fun it appears on the surface. We know that there are temptations and there are fascinations that tell us that what the world is enjoying is so much more than what we poor Christians get to enjoy. They have so much more than we have. <clears throat> but we also know what you may not have discovered yet, and that is the pain and the consequences of those sinful choices. Because sin always comes at a price, and a price that you may not be willing to pay. So stop where you are and rethink what you're doing. Stop what you, where you are, rethink the choices you're making, and just come home. Listen again to what David said. Make me to hear joy and gladness so that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Broken bones here are the consequences of sin and backsliding. And this lack of joy that he's sensing is also a consequence of backsliding. His joy was gone. But he thought that it was fun while he was doing it. Don't we? This is so much fun. I'm enjoying myself. What could be bad about this? How could something that feels so right be so wrong? I could quote so many other songs for you. <laughs> but I'm going to spare you. Though it was fun for a while, we see him longing for the joy again. Where is that joy? What's he talking about? He's talking about missing that blessed experience of being in the congregation of saints and, and hearing their worshipful songs of joy and praise being sung, being raised to God in sincerity and in honesty and truth. There's nothing like it when you're right with God. There's nothing more painful when you're not right with God. The backslidden Christian is certainly not happy to be in that kind of scene. Oh, he used to be happy. He used to be in love with what God was doing, but now he's uncomfortable 
in a spiritual place. He's uncomfortable in church, having one foot in the world and one foot, one foot in Christ. What an uncomfortable feeling. You can envision the guy who's got one foot on the shore and the other on the, on the rowboat. Something's going to give eventually. He's spiritually confl- conflicted, even emotionally torn up as sin has robbed him of his joy. But David wanted to come back now. I want to come back. How about you? Are you ready to come back? Are you ready to come home? Are you ready to say to God, I want to come home? David's prayer is actually recorded for you in verse 15. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. See, he'd been suffering up to this point from a case of spiritual lockjaw. I want to praise God. I can't praise God. You see, when we're backslidden, it feels like our lips are sealed, and that's because of guilt. We're guilty, and we know it. Well, how can we sing songs of worship and praise on Sunday when we know what those lips did on Saturday? We know what they said all week long, how they talked, and then suddenly we show up and we're spiritual on Sunday. How can I lay my body upon God's altar knowing where I laid it yesterday? How can I raise my hands to God in prayer knowing what they did just earlier? I feel ashamed in my my own father's house. And you should. But that's not an excuse to run away. David did quite the opposite. In fact, he's the perfect example for backsliders. And though most of us probably haven't killed anyone, We still relate to his feelings of shame and guilt. But David reminds me of a New Testament truth from Romans chapter 8. There is now no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Come home. Come home. God won't let you be happy for long in your backslidden condition, but he is ready to welcome you back into the fold always he's like the prodigal son's father he'll let you have your fun but when you've had your fill he waits for you to come home come home doesn't that sound right doesn't it sound beautiful come home your heavenly father is calling you home Come home. He wants to restore you. He doesn't want to spank you. Think of, he'll spank you while you're running, but when you come home, it's time to kill the fatted calf and celebrate. That's what he wants. You're here. Perhaps you've been suffering the consequences. You've been miserable. And God says, you're home now. Welcome home. Come in. Let's reason together, he says. And God has plenty of experience restoring backsliders. He knows exactly what you need. In fact, his first children, the Jews, yes, they're notorious backsliders. Notorious. Yet through the prophet Isaiah, God said, the redeemed of the Lord shall return. They'll come back to Zion with singing, everlasting joy, and it shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy their sorrow and sighing shall flee away. That is what you want, isn't it? Isn't that what you want? That's what I want for you. David said in verse 12, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. And this is his prayer. This should be your prayer. Restore me to a right relationship again so I can sing again. I want to sing again. Restore me so I can tell sinners to come home too. I want them to come home too. And if you're backslidden, make this your song. Make this your prayer. Make this your song of deliverance, your prayer of praise. More than that, we find in these verses a purpose, a higher purpose. Then, he says, I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. That's the higher purpose. 
and that is to bring other sinners to repentance. And by that, to proclaim the glory of the Lord. And if you're not backslidden, well then this is already your song. And it's the reason we sing. This is why we can sing. Because we already know that we are forgiven. Saved by grace, our sins are washed away. So sing, and sing with joy in your hearts, and sing loudly. as We are God's people, and our purpose is, is just as Peter said in 1 Peter 2.9, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people who belong to God, so that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into this wonderful light. How wonderful is that verse. We're guilty, all of us, of so many terrible and twisted sins, but we know that we are washed by the blood of the Lamb. Jesus has saved us, and because of that, we are a special privileged people who belong to God. And if you're not a part of our group, you can be. It's not a private group at all. Salvation is open to anyone who will believe in Jesus Christ. David said in Psalm 32, Blessed is he who trans, whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity at all and in whose spirit is no deceit. Blessed is that man. Blessed is that person. Are you that person? If you are, well, then you have a good reason to sing as well. Come home. Come home and be respo- Restored. And here's the kicker again. He knows where you've been. He already knows what you've been up to. And yet he says, come home. Shall we pray together? Lord, you have spoken into our hearts. You know every heart. You know where everyone is in their spiritual life and their relationship to you. We pray this morning, speak to us, Lord. As we look around and these walls are being renovated, we ask God for a new heart. Change us. Make us new. Take our hearts and form them as your own. Lord, we ask for your continued grace upon our lives. Lord, we need you. We can't live this life without you. We need you, Lord. So please come and fill us afresh. Fill us, fill us anew of your spirit. Restore to us the joy of your salvation that we will sing with great, great grace and joy in our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for all you've done. Backslider, this message is for you. Come home. Right now in your heart, confess your sin to the Lord. Profess your fresh commitment. Renew your commitment to him right here, right now. Ask him for the power of his spirit. Ask him right now. God, I want to come home. Forgive me. In Jesus' name, amen.